How is everybody? Good. Doing good. It's great to see everybody and be able to gather and meet. Um, tonight we're going to talk about basic gardening and Doug has got a presentation to show there. And we're going to talk about some potatoes and onions. And we have potatoes and onions seed today to give to you along with a garden tool. And um, after he's finished, I'll give you guys some dates to write down. That's all right. So I figure if we turned off all the lights, then you all go to sleep. <laughs> I've been, able, been accused of being able to talk for an hour and not say anything, so hopefully that's not going to be the case this evening. But talk to you a little bit about basic gardening. Uh, we'll see where it goes. I'm sure it'll be different than the one I did at 4.30. <laughs> so, is everybody excited about gardening? I mean, you like the fact that the daffodils and the forsythias and all that are blooming and Warm weather, well, at least till tonight. <laughs> but anyway, I, I get, get the itching to get out there and do some gardening. I've already planted a few things before I was supposed to, but that'll be all right. So, why do you garden? I mean, is the harvest is the reward, right? Well, maybe. <laughs> Actually, uh, getting that fresh produce out of the garden is actually really good. But for me, it's a whole lot about just being out there. It's about when you get busy and all stressed out to be able to go out in the garden and you're just out there a lot of times by yourself and just working in the soil and all. You just, your mind can go somewhere besides all the stress that you've been having to deal with. So. It's just as important for that than it is for the produce that you get. But it's important for the produce as well. Nothing better. We don't like buying vegetables and stuff at the store anymore. They just don't know how to grow stuff, apparently. <laughs> okay. But gardening is a journey. If I ask you, I bet, how many people in here have been gardening for quite a while? Do you garden the same way now that you did when you first started? No. And I guarantee you, even if you're just starting, what you do two or three years from now is going to be different than what you do this year. Because we learn as we go. It's a journey. And, and that's good. I, I don't think anyone has ever lived long enough to really know everything about gardening. So we're all learning. Always learning. We learn from our successes, but we learn probably more often by our failures. Mm -hmm. Because our failures motivate us to do something different, or at least find out what's going on. And once we start trying to research that, we, we, uh, we get better at what we do. So we're always learning. What works well one year may not work quite so well the next year. Uh, it depends on the weather and a whole lot of other factors. I know I did my tomatoes the same way last year as I did the year before. The year before, I had an abundant harvest of tomatoes, and last year, I was sorely disappointed. I got some, got quite a few, but nowhere near what I'd hoped to get. So, it just depends on a lot. Uh, we can't give up when we have a failure because of the weather. We just, next year might be better, right? And the best way to learn is learn from other people's mistakes and successes. And that's why really we have this program, the Grow Appalachia program, is because uh, we, we try to teach techniques that are based on tried and proven ways of doing things. So it's not a hypothetical, it's the way people have been doing it and had success at doing it. Uh, also, other people's experience, uh, well, the extension offices for both Tennessee and Kentucky, a wealth of knowledge based on science. Now, they don't know it all, but, you know, they they got a pretty good grasp on things. <laughs> we also know specialists, so that, that's the church extension. Right. <laughs> Just know somebody that does know. Exactly. I know a guy that, <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, so what we grow and eat. There's two types of products that we get from the garden, besides peace and well-being and all that kind of stuff. Those are fruits and vegetables. Tell me what fruits are. Give me some examples of fruit. Tomatoes. Yes. Strawberries. Watermelon. Now they're doing good stuff. The last time is it apples, peaches, <laughs> plums. Because most people, when you think of fruit, that's what you think of. We'll find out what makes it a fruit, what's a vegetable. A fruit is a structure produced from a flower. So when that flower gets pollinated and the ovary matures, that's the fruit. And that's the things like the tomatoes and the peppers and the beans and, and, all, and the melons and all that. So there's some examples. You know, tomato is a fruit, but you don't put it in a fruit salad. Right? <laughs> okay. So that leaves the vegetable. What is a vegetable? Most people consider vegetables tomatoes, peppers, and squash, and all this stuff. So a vegetable is a part of the plant. Either the roots, or the leaves, or the stems, or the flowers. If you eat the flowers, or the flower before it opens up, then that's actually a vegetable, right? Anybody know any examples of a flower that we eat before they actually bloom? Well, some people eat squash flowers. What about, you ever eat broccoli? You ever eat cauliflower? Those things are just getting ready to open up and, and bloom. Okay, so vegetable, potatoes, lettuce, cabbage, carrots, broccoli, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Okay, flowers require a pollinator. What do they do? They transfer pollen from one flower to another and, and fertilize that so that you can produce fruit. So pollinators are things like bees, other insects, wind. And I had to fill this in. The loss of honeybees and other native bees have been a, a lot of concern for a lot of people for a few years, especially since the honeybee decline back, uh, I don't know, a couple decades ago, I guess, when the Varroa mite was introduced, and then, then you've got the colony collapse disorder and all that kind of thing that's really wreaking havoc on bees. Are the but numbers growing? Uh, I, I think they are. People learn how to uh, treat their beehives and so that they can survive. But one thing that I have noticed, of course, honeybees are not native to North America, right? They're a European thing or African thing or whatever. Uh, when we first lost a lot of bee hives to the Varroa mite, I noticed at that time a whole lot of native bees, uh, you know, really multicolored sweat bees we call them, and, and a lot of the other native bees that actually were increasing in numbers. So there's probably some kind of competition between bees out there anyway. So hopefully we're going to always have it, but it's you know, it's a concern when we're doing something to our environment to the point that we're losing a chief pollinator. They use, a lot of people that have huge number of colonies of honeybees move those things around from place to place as pollinators. They sell their services as pollinators, especially in the orange groves in Florida and places like that. So anyway, I've talked about all that, but mainly they're di disappearing due to pesticides, herbicides, disease, or you know just pest organisms themselves. Basic requirements of garden plants: of course, they need something to eat. They need good nutrients. They need water, and they need the sun sunlight. So let's look at each one of those in a little bit more detail. Basically, when we're talking about nutrients, we're talking about the soil and what it has in it because that's where the minerals are and the, and the elements that they need to grow. But healthy soils grow healthy plants. Make sense? You got poor so soils, they're not gonna be healthy, and a, he a plant that's not very healthy is gonna be subject to attack by pests more than a healthy plant. 
soils are more than just dirt. A, a large part of soil is uh, eroded rocks, those kind of things, just into smaller particles, right? Over your sand, for example. But soil consists of the soil itself and a whole host of living organisms from bacteria, fungi, and other things like earthworms. And there's a thousand different soil organisms that actually promote a healthy soil. So that ecosystem that's intact, if you can keep an intact soil ecosystem in your garden, you're gonna have healthy plants. And that's what we're all after. One of the things that we do a lot uh, is tilling soil over and over and over every year. And what that does, it's disrupting that ecosystem and eventually it's going to degrade the soil. If we do that, we have to continually add uh, amendments like the compost and, and that into the soil just to kind of halfway keep it ticking along. But we find out it's better to not really disturb it any more than absolutely necessary. Even commercial growers are now getting that idea. That's why a lot of them do seed drilling for planting crops and so on instead of tilling. Anybody ever heard of the Dust Bowl back in the 30s, 20s and 30s? That was because of improper soil management. Okay, compost. Rich, broken down vegetable material. Manure, worm castings, that kind of thing. Uh, one of the things that you can get several places around is comp uh, composted horse manure that comes from the mushroom caves where they grow the uh, agaricus mushrooms, that, the most common mushrooms that you can buy in stores, for example. Uh, but compost actually balances the soil pH, which is good. So it keeps it somewhere close to neutral, generally just a little bit less than neutral, what Tracy talked about last week, or month, not week. Compost that organic material in the soil helps maintain soil moisture, which is important. So when you go for extended periods of time where you don't have rainfall, if you got good organic content in your soil, there's moisture there that those plant roots can take up. Sir, real quick. Uh, do you provide, do you guys have resources uh, for finding compost, you know, people that may sell this stuff? Locally, or where could you obtain compost besides trying to generate yourself? Yeah, I, I get on Facebook Marketplace and try to find it. Uh, I bought some recently that was supposedly the mushroom compost here in Scott County that ended up not really being composted very much. It was just horse manure and straw. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the stuff that you buy from Walmart, that'll break you up if you buy enough of that to really make a difference, right? I if you buy it in... I found some the other day. It, uh, surplus sells in Corbin, and they're delivering me a truck full. Okay. Now, what kind of compost is it? It's mushroom compost. Okay. I was going to get the kind out of Lexington that's organic, and they bring a tractor trailer full. But it's $1,700, so I'm going to save that for another time. Yeah. Huh? Lexington. Oh, the Lexington. Oh, Lexington. She got the some from coming from Corbin, though, she said. Yeah, I got some coming from Corbin. But the one out of Lexington is the best, and it's organic, and it's uh, thoroughbred that they take out the stalks. So that's like the best one there is, but I, I don't want to pay that price right now for that. Yeah. Nope. Now, you can, you can buy just horse manure. People are glad to get rid of it at the places, but most of the time it's not being composted. Yeah, where I work, there's horse stables. The, the person is happy. Whoever wants to go and just leave a tra trailer there for a week, they'll fill it up for you. Mm. And you can take it home and compost it yourself. Nitrogen sources and causing it to compost even faster, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a good way to do that. Okay. Mulch. Does anybody mulch their garden? Okay. 
I always knew it was a good thing, and sometimes I did, and sometimes I didn't. It always works better when you do. Uh, if you don't mulch it, uh, well, let's talk about it first. <laughs> I need to use straw. Straw's great. That's what this is on my raised yeah. bed. You have the same problem if you use the hay with the seat with the weeds. Right. Use straw, not hay. Uh, protects the soil and benefits plants. Uh, straw, grass clippings, shredded leaves, shredded paper, wood chips. Uh, you mentioned wood chips, and a lot of people go berserk. Uh, you don't want, you do not want uncomposted wood chips incorporated into your soil. Okay, they're okay on top, but the moment they get incorporated into the soil, the bacteria in the soil go to work at breaking that down, and they use the nitrogen in the process, and your plants will be starved of nitrogen. So it's it's not good to do that. But putting it on top of the ground. It'll compost itself over the years, but if you have a, a layer of wood chips, what you want to do when you plant is to pull that back and plant directly in the soil and then put that back over that. Don't incorporate it down into the, into the soil. Uh, I'm assuming straw, uh, that would probably, in the course of a growing season, will be at a point that it don't matter. You can put that right into the soil, mixed in with it. When I started trying to do some of the gardening, the YouTube channel I watched recommended using that type of material. So I went to Lowe's thinking I would pick up stuff there. So I was thoroughly uh, <laughs> confused. <laughs> yep. Because I knew, I knew they were to buy something that was used for landscape that had a dye in it. But exactly when you're talking about wood chips, what are you talking about? Like the, when the utility companies chip up wood would be a good thing, or uh, shavings and stuff that you could get from a sawmill. Okay. Those kind of things. Because I, I always was told that you should not use wood chips, you should only use the bark. Well, the reason people want to, say, to use bark, shredded bark mulch, right. is for termites. Ah. Uh, the termites are not as likely to eat the cork of a bark as they are the, the wood of wood chips. You can use the, the chips of the, like the sawmill. Right, you can. I, I, my whole garden, we get a no-till. Really? I and mean, we pass the trees with some people who come down for a little bit. You just put it on top. Yeah, you want to make sure you don't mix it into the soil. Oh, just lay it on top then, like you just... And if it's right. like yeah, if, if you till that into the soil, you're in trouble for probably okay. a year or two. Okay. That'll be my guess. Keep that cardboard boxes down. Yeah, I don't know. That'll work. Mm -hmm. Anything. Uh, anything that you can put on the top will work. Uh, it'll save a lot of work with weeds. Mm -hmm. What, what we, we got to understand is uh, nature does not like bare ground. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of weeds or any kind of a, an annual plant that comes in is to cover that ground so that it protects that soil environment, right? So lots of seeds, weed seeds out there, they will come up if you leave it the ground exposed. They'll either blow in or they're already there. The seed source is already there. But if you put that straw down, and that's what I've got on my raised bed here, about two or three inches, I think mine are right at three inches, keeps the sunlight from reaching that soil and it'll keep the weed seeds from germinating. So it works works great. Now is that how you fix it for winter? Or yeah, I mean yeah. to do that winter time. I, I knew a guy that made uh, kind of a pioneer in McCreary County a few years ago about promoting uh, people doing raised beds. And what he would do is take carpet strips, the width of his raised beds and cut that but there's a lot of synthetic stuff in carpet, and I don't necessarily think I would recommend that, but that's better than letting the sun and the weather uh, degrade your soil. Well, you couldn't even use um, newspapers? Yeah, newspapers are great. Years past, the inks that they used were not good, but now they use inks that are not harmful. So, helps retain soil moisture and promotes cooler soil. So if you've got a mulch layer on top of your plants in the summertime, the soil will be cooler, which is more beneficial. 
I'll try to move on. Also, uh, one of the problems with tomatoes, if you've got bare soil and it rains, that raindrop hits the ground and splashes up soil onto the plant. With that soil that's splashed up on the plant are the disease organisms like the blight and things that are going to destroy your plant. If you have a multilayer, it keeps that raindrop from being able to splash that soil up. Fertilizer, won't talk about that too much, uh, but the Grow Appalachia program really promotes the organic fertilizers, and there's a reason for that. Uh, it be actually benefits the soil ecosystem. Instead of the chemical fertilizers, you can buy like 10, 10, 10, 12, 12, 12, and all that, which if used over a longer period of time, actually causes the salt residue to be built up in the soil, which degrades the quality of your soil. We don't have the fertilizer in yet, but we're expecting that soon. So just check your emails and your text messages and stuff, and I'll let everybody know when that comes. Okay. So organic fertilizer promotes healthier food, right? Don't have all that stuff in your body. Okay, water. Too much water is just as bad as not enough water. You can drown them or dry them up. But good moisture retention in your soil is good, but it needs to be well drained. And it greatly enhances that by using compost and mulch in your garden. Make sure your garden area is well drained. Don't plant in the swamp, unless you're wanting to raise rice. <laughs> and raised beds and elevated rows, which are basically just increase the depth in the, your planting area without borders is what an elevated row is. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. But this, if you can see that one on the lower right, it's probably not very good back in the back, but uh, I've got four rows of, 40, four 40-foot 40 rows of raised beds in my garden, and I'm glad I do. <laughs> I really like those. Sun. What value is the sun to plants? Photosynthesis, right? That's what they use. They use the sun to make the sugars that feeds the plants and feed us. Gardens need eight or more hours of direct sunlight, or most plants do. Some things like lettuce and some of the leaf crops or whatever can do well with less. Time. Let us probably, as long as you got, what, three hours or four, you're probably good. Because you, you do want that sunlight hitting it because that increases the nutrient value of the plants. And in a garden, you can kind of orient your rows from east to west instead of north to south. And the reason for that is when the sun comes up in the east, all day long, all the plants and all the rows are getting access to that sunlight. Whereas if I turn it to where I've got them north and south, if I've got higher plants or taller plants on the east side, it may be midday before the rest of my, <coughs> of my garden actually gets access to the sun. And the biggie is that, that sunlight, the proper amount of sunlight is necessary for when the fruit gets to the point of being mature, all those sugars that are produced when a fruit ripens that makes it taste so good, and that's why we do this thing, those things are because of the, in, the sufficient amount of sunlight. Does that apply also to um, uh, greenhouses? Should they also go east and west instead of north and south? Well, I've got some high, high tunnels as well, mm -hmm. and they are oriented north and south. Okay. Because they have, you know, it's, you've got, from the time it first comes up, that, that high tunnel or greenhouse would have access to that sun. So, and usually you're not got tall stuff in there that's going to block it in, in that. And according to what you want, I mean, sometimes having a tall plant that blocks the sunlight might be better if you've got cabbage and a lot of the things like that, or lettuce, or whatever. 
but most of the plants that we're after in the summertime need that sunlight. Okay, some general rules. I'll try to, make, I need to wind this up pretty soon. Don't walk on the planting space. Why? The place where you're planting the plants. Why not walk on it? Because it'll compact the soil. Right, and that's not good. You need it aerated and, and all. So only walk on the walkways. Don't bite off more than you can chew. Start small. <laughs> you do. I always spend way too much. But when it, the bottom line is a small space well taken care of produces more than a large space that's neglected. I know that from experience. My wife says, you need to plant less this coming year. So I've got three extra garden places in addition to what I already have. <laughs> but I'm hoping I got a little bit more time to take care of it. Another thing, grow what you eat primarily, right? Don't devote most of your garden to stuff that you don't know whether you like or not or whatever. Stuff that you know that you're going to eat, plant that stuff. But don't stop there. Every year, try something, one or two additional things, because you might find something that you didn't realize that you love, but now you do. So experiment. Here's a biggie. Eliminate weeds when they are small. Why? Because they get big and go to seed. It's a whole lot easier to take that uh, scuffle hoe or uh, stirrup hoe, and <laughs> I'm thinking about scuffle hoes. Stirrup hoes, one of the options that you have to pick if you're a new member tonight. Skim off the top inch or so of the soil where the weeds are, instead of taking a regular hoe and chopping deep and digging that stuff up. Because if you chop deep in the garden, what are you going to do? You're going to expose lots more weed seed. So it'll, it'll be a never-ending battle. But if you just scrape off that top inch when those weeds are real small, it kills them off. And then especially if you put a mulch layer on after that, then you don't have a problem with the weeds. And I think all of us would love that. Partner with nature and learn as you go. And by all means, plant something to make your garden look pretty. Plant some flowers. Some flowers. Hobby seeds are beautiful. Yep. Hollyhocks. So a whole bunch of stuff you can plant, but it also attracts pollinators. So when to plant. Two different types of plants that we focus on in gardening, cool season plants and warm season plants. Talk about cool season. They're more cold hardy. They can survive colder temperatures. They can survive, some of them can su survive frost, right? They can be grown and planted before the last frost in the spring or after the first frost in the fall. Actually, if you grow the cool season plants in the fall, it's best to plant them about mid-August, mid to late August, and they will do Great. I think they're easier to grow in the fall. They're a lot easier to grow. You don't have the same pests that attack them in the spring. Uh, I, I planted cabbage and carrots and broccoli and Brussels sprouts and what else? Kale and mustard and turnips and all that kind of stuff back about that time last year. I just harvested my last cabbage last week. This week, I, I finished digging up all of my carrots that I'd been eating on all winter. Got 20 pounds of carrots in my final harvest in a raised bed. What kind of carrots do you grow? I, I grew one this year called Bolero. Mm -hmm. And they are, I have never grown carrots as nice as those. I mean, they were a couple inches, two and a half, well, probably a couple inches in diameter and about that long. I mean, and they were, of course, they were in my raised bed. The soil was soft. If you're going to grow carrots, you need soft, loose soil. About that. I, I love eating stuff all through the winter. A lot of people around here didn't realize that you could do that. Uh, what I did, um, those one of my 40-foot rows 
of raised beds. I put hoops over those and put road cover. And I would go through the winter, and on warm days I'd uncover it. Most of the time I'd have it covered over. All you got to do is go over and lift that thing up, and you've got nice food to eat. We picked about a picked about a peck of uh, spinach today, so good fresh spinach is always good. But you do have to offer them some kind of protection if you grow them through the winter. So lettuce, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower. I have a hard time pronouncing Brussels sprouts because. I always thought it was Brussels sprouts, but it's not. So anyway, kale, carrots. And also spinach, right? Oh yeah, there's a whole, that's just some examples. There's a lot of stuff. All of the cabbage family and all that are, are biggies. Okay, warm season plants. That's the ones most of us are after in the garden, right? Can only be planted when there's no danger of frost. Most of those things are tropical in origin, or at least subtropical. So they, if you plant those and it frosts, bye-bye. Uh, you know, if it's not too awful bad, you can't cover them up. But the reality is you don't really gain anything by planting them real early because the soil temperatures haven't warmed up enough. They'll just sit there kind of in standby mode. And once the soil temperatures get up about 50, or nighttime temperatures get up to about 50 on average, and past the frost, then they'll start going. So I can almost guarantee you that you can take a smaller plant, plant it at the right time, and outdo one that you planted earlier. So just say nighttime temperatures around 50. Usually in our, our area, it's about the first or second week of May. Last year it was May the 11th when you could have planted so after it warmed up that morning. I got so excited after last meeting that probably a week or so after it, I decided to start my seed trays. <laughs> and I already had tomatoes that are about that high. So are they way too early? Uh, you'll be all right. Just I got peas that are this tall. You'll probably have to repot them into some bigger pots before yeah, so that they'll... Survive. I started but. panicking that I was going to have them, you know, it, because it does stunt the growth. Even when once you put it in the soil, if you put them out too, or you know, too big. Yeah. I mean, I, I think a smaller plant will actually do better mm -hmm. planted in the garden. I mean, you can go to Walmart or Lowe's and buy Bonnie plant tomato plants that are that tall and all that. But you also get one that you started yourself that's that tall, and it'll outperform that other one. So. So, so you think about those, sorry to jump in, but you know, the, the plant might be big, but what's the root system? Right. What does that look like? And so, well, right now, and that's the important water, part. So, yeah. you know, but I have watermelons up too. So I got a little too excited, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I probably, I mean, this is just me, I wouldn't start cucumbers and melons and that kind of stuff from seed indoors. I would wait till you can plant those things as seed outside. But on the flip side, you can't plant tomato seed in the garden. Mm -hmm. You need to get a, do that by a transplant. So, who was say, somebody was saying that they, oh, one of the people in the last class after it was over with said that he was somewhere and they were selling corn plants for a dollar per oh, pot for corn that was about a foot tall. I thought, okay, you can buy, you can probably buy enough to plant an acre for a couple of three dollars on corn seed. Well, maybe exaggerating a little bit. And now you plant that seed, when it germinates and pops up, it's establishing the root system right away and it'll do well. That one transplanted to the garden from a pot is not going to do very well. And you're wasting your money. Okay, I'll, I'll move on. <laughs> tomatoes, peppers, squash, cucumbers, melons, okra. Sweet potatoes are a little bit different because not only does it have to be just after the frost danger is over with, but you need to wait on sweet potatoes till probably June, mm -hmm. somewhere in there to plant those because they are, they want it hot and they'll do really well. 
when it's hot. The sweet potatoes are in the morning glory family, if you know what morning glories are. So, seeds are transplants, what we were just talking about. It's a whole lot cheaper if you can plant it with seeds than it is. Uh, transplants, you can, you, you can get a lot of transplants started from one pack of seed. Okay? Or you can go to Bonnie plants at Walmart or Lowe's and pay how much per pot, one plant? Uh, a lot. $3 and something. So which is better, starting them yourself or getting them free with the Grow Appalachia program, right? <laughs> Later on, that's, that's even better. You don't have to worry about the making the transplants, planting the seeds. Spacing, that's always, that's a good question. It depends on what, what you're talking about, uh, about, what type of plant, but always look at the seed packet to de decide how far apart to plant those seeds or the transplants, or some trusted source, like one of the, you know, from the extension agencies from tried and proven ways of doing things. So the one I think you all had a copy emailed to you was ID-128 from the University of Kentucky. Uh, that's home vegetable gardening in Kentucky. Good source, highly recommend looking at that. I have new books today. <laughs> okay, books instead of digital files. Yep. Okay, so it varies, so check your seed packet. The interest, well, overcrowding promotes diseases and reduces productivity. Why does it do that? If you got them real close together and your soil is not real fertile, then those plants are gonna be competing with each other for the available nutrients. But if you got real healthy soil and you're planting in something like a raised bed, you can plant them closer. And if you get a chance, check out uh, the square foot gardening method. Uh, that's, that's always a good one to look at. Uh, it will scare you how close that those plants are, but it starts with healthy soil. So find a balance that works for you. So planting styles, wide rows or single rows. Most gardeners in the past always garden with a single row, drive your stake, stretch a string to the other end of the garden and dig you a furrow and plant it in there and then step over about three or four foot and then make you another row. Is that a good way to do it? It works. <laughs> Okay, what's recommended now is a, kind of an elevated row that's about 30 to 36 inches wide with only about an 18 to 24 inch walkway in between them. A lot of commercial production is done that way. A lot of small scale uh, market gardeners do the same thing. But that's a single row type down here. Single row is fine if you got something that spreads out like a squash, like there on the left. But you got a lot of wasted space in there that you could be using. So 30 to 36 inches, 18 to 24 inch walkways, and there's a lot of wasted space if you do single rows. A lot of space in between your rows for weeds to grow. <laughs> I've done that before. <laughs> That's the advantage of getting them when they're young because if you let it get to that point, they have won. You have lost. <laughs> okay, here's raised beds. Uh, Is that metal roofing on the second That's galvanized metal roofing. Huh. Okay, you can use a lot of things, a lot of materials, but generally you don't want a raised bed over four foot wide. Why? Well, first of all, we can't reach that. So you can reach over. <laughs> if, if I've got a, a raised bed that's about six foot or eight foot w wide, how am I going to get to the stuff that's in the middle? You never want to stay there, yeah. Must have a piece of dirt there out of my garden on the, <laughs> in my shoes. <laughs> okay, but so you can reach across. You know, I mean, you, even if you have to go around to the other side to reach the other side, that's good. You 
can make it from a variety of materials. Uh, the ones that I've got down here, I bought some uh, two by 12 oak lumber, rough cut from a sawmill in Western McCurry County and put those in about three years ago and they are still doing fine. Untreated yeah. and just, I mean, they'll probably be there for a few more years. But a two by 12, 10 foot long is not cheap when you're buying a bunch of them to do four rows, a four foot wide by 40 foot long rows. Well, That's that, a lot. That would last a lot longer than people think because my husband built me a porch on um, this little building that I had that I had an office in and he used rough cut untreated wood. That was 27 years ago and it's still standing. It needs to have a few things replaced on it, but we thought we would be lucky to get three or four years out of it. It's yeah. 27. So. Right. Well, the main thing about it is just make sure you've got something that's going to hold the soil yeah. in place. Uh, the metal, there's a place, uh, a YouTube channel called uh, Homesteadonomics, if you ever look at YouTube. He's a guy in western United States that builds these metal, galvanized metal ones in a real simple design that'll probably last for the lifetime of any of us in here. And it uses metal, what, usually what, three foot wide is a lot of the roofing that corrugated like that, uh, about three foot wide, cuts them, he cuts them I think in 12 to 15 inch heights and uses a two by four and a one by four on top, the two by fours, are kind of turned up on their, you know, the, the narrow edge. The, the, they're taller up and down than they are wide. So they're two inches wide. And he puts the one by four on the top of it, overhanging just a little bit, and he screws the metal to the two by four under the lip of that one by four so you don't get cut on it. And he sticks that into the ground, the metal, and it lasts forever and looks really good. Is it with a piece of wood on the inside? He just, all he does is uh, he puts them together on his, he just does a 45 degree angle, so they come together. Hmm. When you're using materials like, this just be a stupid question, but when you're using materials like that, I'm assuming that, that <clears throat> in the really hot temperature, does it change your watering needs in a raised bed like that? Well, I would assume that uh, there's probably a little bit bit more moisture loss in a metal one than there would be in a wood one. Yeah, I've had the metal before and it's going to heat hotter. Yeah. But if it's, you know, vertical, the sun's not going to shine on it directly too often to actually warm it up. It's not, I don't think it's going to be enough to really make a lot of difference. Yeah, I, and that was when I was living in the desert, so I noticed that a lot more. It might be different in this climate. I'm sure it got real hot there, didn't it? Yeah, it was ridiculous. Okay. So, but you can take uh, some small trees, lay those out, loosely put them in there, nail them together, so you have it, four uh, four sides. Fix your dirt in there, and it'll work. Soil, not dirt. Got that right? <laughs> <laughs> Raised beds or an elevated bed allows planting a little bit earlier in the spring because the temperature of the soil warms up a little bit more because it's up in the air instead of down in the, in the ground. And it has, provides for better drainage. So if you're in an area that's got a little bit of moisture uh, issues, then raised beds would be a good way to go. On the last class, because I had to quit by a certain time before, <laughs> Just say it. <laughs> okay, I'm about over through with this presentation, but vertical gardening. How many people do vertical gardening? Just Not with all of your stuff, just some things, right? Very good thing to do. Uh, trellis when possible. All kinds of things you can use. Just a, an old tobacco stick or a tomato stick and stick, sticking in the ground to hold your tomatoes up is a type of vertical gardening. Uh, I bought a 300 and something foot roll of five foot tall called Hortanova, which you buy from a garden supply place. It's a trellis thing that's got like six inch squares in it. 
and you put up a T-post on each end, fasten it to the T-post, and you got a ready-made trellis. And I highly recommend that because it lasts for years. It's UV resistant. Uh, you can take it out, you know, trellis your beans or whatever. Let them dry out, just crumble them up. They fall off and roll that thing up and put it in the in a bag and use it again next year. So it's a good, really good way to do it. A lot of people use just regular fencing. Uh, cattle panels, they're about 16 foot long. Cattle panels are probably only about four foot high though. So, but you can still run a lot of things on a cattle panel because you don't have to have it sitting right on the ground. You can have it up a foot off the ground so you end up with a five foot high area, for, especially for beans or peas or something like that. You can even trellis tomatoes with a cattle panel. Just tie them to the, to the wires on it. Cattle panel at tractor supply costs you about 20 bucks, something like that. But again, they don't rust. They'll last for, for your life, probably. It just depends on uh, how creative you are. I'm just stipulated since I wasn't here for the first one. But uh, I would just take uh, posts and run wire. Yeah, a wire would do good string. Does that have to be what? To the cucumbers and stuff? Or? Just trellis beans and uh, peas. Uh, it could be beans. Uh, sometimes I was yeah. lazy and didn't have stuff for tomatoes, and so I'd just put a post on one side and on the other side and you know, use wires to kind of keep them up. Um, uh, as long as the plant uh, works with growing up, then you know, go with it. So right. yeah, beans, cucumbers, other squashes, tomatoes. Last year, I went to, I'd gone to Florida and happened to run across a place that had about bamboo, about, I don't know, some of it was probably three inches or, or better. I mean, it was huge bamboo. And it was, I think I cut it off so I could get it back to Kentucky <laughs> at about 12 foot or something like that. Uh, brought it up here and in my raised beds, I drove a T-post and each well, in my raised, on each side of my raised bed, and then I zip tied that thing with super strong zip ties to the the, the bamboo to the T post, and I put a, a a wire string about eight foot tall all the way across from one to the other, and then I hung hay baling twine from it down to my tomatoes, and I used tomato clips, and of course I single stem prune them and. And that's how I did my tomatoes. It worked pretty good. Uh, I'm going to drive my T-post a little deeper next time because uh, when you get a lot of weight on it and it's real rainy and they tend to kind of lean towards each other, and when they do, it doesn't do as well. <laughs> um, I used to grow beans, and I would take the bamboo, but the creek canes. It's a small creek cane that we that grows native around here. Right. And they would be tall, like 12 feet or something, and I'd make like a teepee with six of them. Yep. And then I would put plant beans at each post, and they would just grow up it. So you could yep. even stand inside of it and pick them. And yep. if it was too tall, you just got on a little ladder and step stool and could pick them. And oh my gosh, I'd get more beans than I could know what to do yep. with. They grew so well. I guarantee you, a generation ago in Scott, McCurry County, if you went to somebody's garden, they had bean poles to trellis their beans with. I mean, we call them bean poles, but the bamboo, the creek cane. Uh, problem is, it's not as easy to find anymore as it used to be. It's not that it's been over harvested, I just think that, you know, habitats have been graded and changed and all this kind of stuff because I can cut that bamboo off and there'll be two grow up next time. I mean, they, they can survive and they spread. But well, if we didn't have enough of the bamboo, my husband, we had quite a few trees. He'd just find one about that big, you know, and he would cut it, and we would use those to replace them. Yeah. So all kinds of things to do, but a vertical garden, it makes it, your garden easier to manage. Keeps the fruit off the ground, conserves space. And by keeping it off the ground, it reduces the disease that gets to your plants. And again, incorporating that with the mulch layer underneath, you can't go wrong. Easier to harvest. So which plants can you trellis? Obviously cucumbers, 
tomatoes, beans, and peas. What else? Some types of squash. Certain types of squash. I did spaghetti squash last year, and they did really well on the, on the trellis. A lot of things like that, if you don't trellis them, they're going to spread all over your garden. And, and then the weeds start getting in them, and it's a real pain. You can't clean up the ground. Right. So it makes the garden easier to manage by having them up off the ground. So, happy gardening. Thanks, Doug. <laughs> I'm not through yet, by the way. We're going to talk about planting potatoes and, oh, yes. Yes. and onions. That's why I said I don't have to quit as soon on this class. <laughs> Okay, we can turn the light on though, I think, at this point. I'll let Rhonda tell you what she's going to be giving you in just a minute, or did you already do that? No, um, you guys will be receiving four pounds of candy potatoes, two pounds of red, and two pounds of Yukon gold, and then you'll receive two pounds of onions, and you can choose either the red, white, or yellow. And you will also receive a garden tool. Okay. But anyway, when you get these, these are the, this is the, the Kenny back, one of the Kenny backs that's in this bag that I've got up here. There's only like, uh, I think this is the Kenny backs, aren't they? Was that? Okay. So it doesn't, there's not a lot of them to make up four pounds. But the thing about a potato is you don't go out and just plant that thing in the ground. You want to maximize how many you can plant. So what you do, they, they, uh, before you get ready to plant, if, if you're going to plant soon, then just go ahead and leave these out so there'll be room temperature until you start the process. If it's going to be a little while before you can plant them, keep them in a cooler, darker place uh, until you know a day or two before you get ready to plant them. But when you're ready, you bring these out, and a potato is a, a tuber, which is actually a white potato, Irish potato, is actually an underground stem. It's not a root, it's an underground stem. Sweet potato is a root, okay? So you do them a little bit different on how you, you get these started. Being an underground stem, stems have little buds where other branches comes off, like on a, think about a tree or whatever. Each one of these things that we call the eyes on a potato are the nodes where new buds, or where the buds are, it's going to sprout into a branch. Okay? So what you want to do is look at that potato and try to locate those nodes. They'll be either, either a little dimple or they will have already started growing a little bit. Look at it and see how you're going to cut this thing up. Cut it till it's about two to three ounces of potato with about two or three eyes on each section. But, so you, you don't want to just slice it. and You want to angle the cuts and make sure you've got lots of skin with eyes. So on this particular one here, I've got one, two, three, four, four eyes right here. So I could cut... I could cut this one all the way around right here and have about the right size. So when it starts growing, it's going to have four places where the plant's going to come out of the ground. Looking around, I can do three eyes here. Got another one on the end, so I can angle that cut down and have four, four eyes. And that gives me three on the other side. So out of that one potato, I've got three potatoes that I can plant. Okay. Once you do that, it's going to be very moist and watery and all that. So you don't want to just plant it immediately because you increase the likelihood that that thing's going to rot. So put that in a dry place and kind of separate them a little bit. Not a lot necessarily, but let them actually dry out. Uh, scab over, so to speak. Uh, and then you'll be planting that thing. So when you take all these, you could probably, out of the seven potatoes that's in here, you can at least have, and there'll be more based on what size your potatoes are, 
you could probably have enough to plant 21 plants in a row. Okay, so you got your, you go out to plant, and you've got your row figured out where you're going to lay it. Now, this is all, if you're putting it in a conventional garden, you know, with a furrow. If you're doing it in a raised bed, you can plant them a little bit closer. You can, because again, all the healthy soil and all that. Dig your furrow probably six to eight inches deep. Take some of the organic fertilizer that you're going to be getting and put a good, healthy amount of fertilizer because it's not going to burn the plants. The organic one won't. All across your whole trench. Then rake some of that soil back over that fertilizer for about an inch or two. And then go along and plant your potatoes. Plant them about three or four inches deep with about three or four inches of soil on top of them. About every 12 inches apart. Or if you want to be, if you've got a big space, you can go 18 inches apart, a foot and a half instead of a foot. But if you've got good healthy soil, a foot apart will be sufficient for each plant to maximize its production. Okay, so cover it up, level, and then go away and let it wait till it starts growing. And then when that plant gets up to about six, eight inches tall, get you a rake, garden rake, or your hoe, and start healing that potato row. Heal it wide instead of narrow and go up about, uh, leave about three or four inches of the plant sticking out the top of that healed up mound of dirt that you've got. And then let it go and probably, probably a week later it'll be up about a foot at that point and you'll do another process of healing that thing and get it up to about three or four inches. And you can do it again if you want to or just leave it at that point. What happens is when you bury part of that plant, it's a stem, but it's going to produce more stems or is it not rhizomes, what's it called? Tubers. Tubers. Yeah. Well, you know, the runners, whatever we want to call them. And that's what's going to produce potatoes. If I don't heal it up, I limit the production of that plant. The more soil I can fill up on that, the more potatoes you're going to have. Most of our potatoes are indeterminate, which means really if you, as much as you want to heal them up, they'll still produce. You got a question? Yeah. Is it possible to start with your depth of soil, let's say, low, and then add more soil instead of healing? Yeah, well, that's what you're doing. You're, adding, right. You can add more soil, but just in the process of healing that up, you're actually eliminating weeds that's in that walkway between that too, so you're pulling that up, so you're okay. killing two birds with one stone, so to speak. <laughs> so I've always planted mine in rows, but this year I want to do something different because I'm getting older and it's harder to dig them, and it's so hot <laughs> it's time to get them. So I'm going to do mine in pots this year. So is that what I do, is wait till they get a certain size and then add more, door. Add more soil, just keep going till you come up? Yes. So if I started, I'm going to cut the bottoms out, okay? That way when I harvest them, all I have to do is just pull it up and let it just fall out. Okay. So um, what, how many inches of soil would I start with, like five or six? Well, if you got it in contact with soil, you could probably lay it on the surface of the soil and as long, and then put th about three or four inches of dirt on top of it and then just keep adding it up. Okay. You can also heal it up with straw mm -hmm. or stuff like that as well. but. Having soil is a good thing to, to do. Growing potatoes. If you plant them in a raised bed, I had a, a four by ten raised bed with like, the Irish potatoes. I planted them about a foot apart, so I had four for you know ten ten rows of four, forty plants in a one that size, and my soil was real loose. When it come time that the plants on top died back, and I started to harvest them. I didn't have to get a hoe out and chop. I just had to stick my hand down in there. And the first row or two was a little bit more difficult than the rest of them. I just kind of pulled the soil over to one side, and then I could work my way across that whole bed and get all the potatoes that were in it. And it was really easy, and they were clean, and it was a good experience. I like good experiences. Do you raise worms in your 
Um, raised beds. My, my raised beds are full of worms. I don't put them in, they're just there. Yeah, but I mean, so you do put worms in yours? No, I don't put them in. They, no. they just, they, they just find their way there. I see. Okay. Because yeah. when it rains at my house, my driveway and everything's just full of worms. Yeah. And that's a good thing, right? Yeah. What the worms are eating is that decaying organic material, and then they're excreting valuable fertilizer, <laughs> okay? And it's just, it's scattered all through the soil because that's where the worms go. So they just, it's good to have those in there. Keep it aerated as well. So worms are good. If you don't have worms, get some somewhere and get them started. Okay, uh, onions. Sorry, Rhonda. You got a bunch of onions. Uh, they, these are bulbs or sets, they call them. Uh, sets that are getting close to an inch in diameter are more likely to put out a flower stalk. And if they do that, then the storage ability of that onion later on is greatly reduced. Okay? So, uh, it's better to get the smaller bulbs, and there's a lot of the smaller ones in here, but there's some that are bigger. Go ahead and plant those bigger ones, and kind of keep an idea of where those things are, because I'd recommend you stick these in the ground about an inch or so deep. You don't have to bury them under, just make sure that a good portion of that onion is into the soil. It's good to be able to see some of the onion bulb set, okay? Plant them about two inches apart. And if you're doing it in a raised bed, you could do every two inches width and length. And then after they've grown for a while, and they've got the, the nice green onion, harvest every other one as a green onion, and you'll end up with them spaced about four inches apart, which is ample space for them to be able to form a nice big onion bulb. <laughs> and then later in the year, Probably June, late June sometime, that onion plant will just start to fall over. Kind of gets a kink in it and just kind of falls over. When it starts to do that, get that thing out of the ground and go through the curing process and you'll have a, a good onion supply. Any questions about that? What do you, would it, mine never make it to the onion because we eat them as green onions. <laughs> But if I can this year, I do want to have some go to an onion. How do you process them when you dig them? I mean, do they have to dry out? Or and, and you don't dig onions, hopefully. If mud pull them or you just pull them out. Hopefully your soil has got enough organic material that's going to be loose enough. All you have to do is get a hold of the top of that onion plant and just pull it right out of the ground. Okay. To cure it, and I can I have some advice on this, but I would recommend once you pull it out of the ground, Leave about an inch or two of the green on it, but to cut the rest of it off, and get those in a dry place and let them just dry. And those outer layers of that onion will just develop into a, a papery skin like an onion that you would buy at the store. And I don't think it takes very long to go through that curing process, does it? I don't know off the top of my head, but when I've had it before, it doesn't take long. Um, okay. It's just one where, um, yeah, like I said, it's look to see that kind of papery material. If, if they're wet, then obviously that's not going to store well. Right. right. You don't want to just lay them out, though, in the sun to let them dry out? Or? You can do that okay. up to a certain amount of time. Right. Uh, like, uh, yeah, when I harvest mine before, I'll just, while I'm harvesting, I'll have them out in the sun, but then have it for, you know, not forever, um, but then I'll just go ahead and take them to a dry place inside. And then kind of it's very similar to the way you do garlic as well. And that's one where there will be coming up a early summer. That's when we'll get into the preservation stuff where uh, I know uh, there'll be FCS agents through Extension Family and they'll, they'll have the uh, research side of it telling mm -hmm. them how to uh, store all these products. Right. And then, of course, once you get them cured, it's best to store them in a cool, dry place than it is in, in your house or 
or in some place that's hot because they'll, they'll last longer. Some varieties of onions uh, store longer than others in it too. So, you, you know, I don't know if we have a, even have an idea what variety these are. It's just yellow, white, and red. We don't know what particular variety. So, any other questions? Thank you all. Thank you. Huh? Okay, I got a couple dates I want you to write down or remember. And our next meeting will be April the 15th. Hopefully, we will be able to meet out at the Scott County Farmers Market. But just keep checking your emails and your text messages. I'll keep you guys updated on that. And um, April the 5th. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot. April the 5th. Cameron Lee will open up the greenhouse at um, McQuarrie Central High School for people to go get their cool season crops. So um, this year you'll wear a mask and you'll be able to go in and look and see what he has in there. Um, remember harvest sheets. I know nobody's harvested anything yet, um, but Doug over here, he's got a ton of stuff. I know that they harvested some stuff, like turnips and stuff this week. Yes, I did hear somebody talking about some turnips. Um, uh, take pictures, send them to me. I love those pictures, so take them. It uh, encourages me as well as other gardeners. I use those for our blogs, for our Facebook. And anytime anyone would like to write a couple paragraphs about something they want to share, um, I can put that on the blog. Um, it usually takes about a week, and we'll have our recording ready, and I'll send out all the information where you can watch this again on YouTube channel. And um, one of our participants, um, um, if anybody needs help with taxes, she's willing to do some of that stuff for free um, to help people along.